My friends, we have a myriad of mysteries that may or may not be solved this morning. I'm going to present the findings to you and see what you think. One of them includes this old Washburn Parlor guitar, and I'll tell you about that right after this. My friends, Jerry Rosa here in the Rosa String Works Workshop. It is Tuesday, January 17th, which means we'll be at Dickie's Barbecue Pit in Rolla this evening playing music. We have a great time there. It's, I would say the music is improving steadily every single weekend because, you know, after that COVID layoff, we were kind of rusty. And it's taken us several months to get back in top form, but I think we're very close to our top form now. And I hope you'll come out and uh, give it a try some evening. We would love to have you if you're in the area, of course, or just passing through. Try to pass through at around six o'clock and we stay there till around 8.30 every time. I mentioned that uh, we've got some information on this parlor guitar that is kind of like a mystery solved. I said, you know, this metal plate on here I'd never seen before. Before, and the screws were kind of crude. I think I might have said at that time when I showed this the first time that maybe this was just covering up the place where the bridge had been and the holes. Then in the comments, someone else uh, said, I've got a guitar exactly like that and it has that same thing. So, you know, he thinks it's a factory thing. Maybe, maybe not. This was done incredibly well. You can see it's detailed on the ends. You know, it's not, this is not a homemade item. So I have two schools of thoughts on this. One of them is, since this is very well made and this is definitely not a homemade item, I would say that this would be a standardized repair kit when the bridge comes off that either Washburn put together or it was available somehow at the time through a music dealer or whatever. I mean, I don't think there is such thing like this out there now, but apparently this might have been a widespread problem and this is how they solved it. Uh, aftermarket solve, if you will. And, and if you look at this, this, this is made special. This has got a, you know, a, a channel in it like a pulley and this fits this perfectly. So this is all a kit, if you will. And you had to put this over the place where the bridge was, otherwise this wouldn't slide around. Plus you needed something to cover up the unsightly holes. So you put that there, then you set this on top of there and hook this up and bingo, you're ready to go. You fixed your problem. So that's thought number one, that this was an aftermarket repair kit that either available through Washburn or maybe through a music dealer or something like that, or maybe both. That's just a thought, don't know that for sure. The next thought would be that Washburn had so many different problems with these bridges staying on with their old crummy hide glue that they used to use, that they decided to just fix the problem at the factory. And this is how they solved the problem at the factory. I wish I knew which one of those things were true because I don't know. My guess is it's aftermarket and here's why. Because it does look like the bridge was glued on there to me. You can see how it's chipped out and tore out and it's the wood is roughed up. So to me, there was a real bridge on this at one time and aftermarket, they fixed it. Now that's, you'd have a tough time convincing me otherwise on this because of the fact that it definitely looks like a bridge was glued on here to me. There's not much glue there, but that's not uncommon with hide glue either. <laughs> and you can wash hide glue off, so someone might have washed it off. That's a possibility. That's where we're left with the wash burn for now. I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Which way do you think it was? I think it's an aftermarket thing. I really do because of seeing that this was glued on here at one time. Unfortunately, the aftermarket thing caused that. Moving on from the guitar, I've got quite a few other mysteries either solved or at least we can add a chapter to the mystery. So let's talk about those now. If you saw my last shop talk, you saw me really go in depth on this little contraption here made out of two shotgun shells put together. 
Some people said, how do you know it's a shotgun shell? Well, you can read on there, it's a shotgun shell. <laughs> it's very hard. I would show you in the camera, you're not gonna be able to see it. It's really faint, because it's really old. But it's, it's two shotgun shells. You can just take my word for that. One of our uh, viewers and, in fact, customers that has been here and stayed at our rental retreat, you know, gave me this knife. He is the fellow that solved this problem here. And he gave us a link to show how this was made and what it was used for. According to his link, it's a widgeon slash teal call. Widgeons and teals are a type of uh, game bird, uh, water type bird. This is a call that, you know, should be able to call them in. But as I showed you, it's a whistle. It's supposed to be a whistle. They call it a whistle. There's nothing going on with this. And you can try puckering and there's nothing. There's just nothing. You know, like trying to let your lips, you know, make that sound and blow through it. It doesn't do anything like a trumpet or something, you know. <laughs> anyway, doesn't do anything. Doesn't mean that's not what they tried to make. I think that is what they tried to make. The difference is, if you look at the instructions online, there's a link to those instructions in this video. So check it out later. Don't do it right now, please. Wait until we're done and then go there. But if you check out those instructions, the, the step that these folks missed on this was after you take the primer out, you're supposed to, uh, you know, on the inside of the shell, you're supposed to mash that primer away from the hole to make the hole bigger. And that also leaves a cavity in the middle so air can hollow around inside there, which is what would make the whistle. And they didn't do that here. The, the two primers are absolutely touching each other on the inside, and therefore it's just a straight pass through. There's no ability to whistle. So that's, I think, what they were trying to make. In fact, the dished in sides, the cup here and everything is the exact same online. It's exactly the same, and they show you how they do that too. So I really think he solved the problem. Thank you so much for that. I really do appreciate it. And thank you even more for that knife. That knife is awesome. If you, ha if you don't remember this knife, you push a button and it just opens. I love this knife. And some of you may say, well, that's illegal or whatever. Well, it's not in this state. And not only that, I don't care if it is illegal. It, you pull it out of your pocket. I've always got the other hand busy. Pull this out and I can push the button and cut whatever I'm trying to cut. So I love this knife. There you go. That's, I think that solves that mystery. I think that really is what they were trying to make. Unless I find some more of them. If I find more of them, then it may still be wheels for a toy. <laughs> you know, and, and possibly it, that's what this was all along. You just never know. But uh, anyway, uh, I appreciate that. Uh, investigation work and that really does seem like that's what that is and by the method they used on the computer they definitely could have done that back in the 1800s without any problem that's mystery number one we've got quite a few more mystery number two this was one of my next most intriguing artifacts you can see the fancy design on this you can see the hook there you can see how it's narrowed down right there you can see there's a clip on the back back here I, these, this bend in the middle here, this bend, and this other bend right here, those two bends, I don't think those are supposed to be there. I think that just happened in the ground or at some point in time. The viewer sent me an email, said that this is a deal for hanging pictures on the wall. Back then, they would put a long wire across, you'd hang this on there, and then you'd, your picture would have a wire, and you'd hang your picture right here, and you could slide this along your wall anywhere you wanted and display your pictures. I think that makes perfect sense for this, because this is too heavy for clothing, I, it's what I said to begin with, but it makes perfect sense to hang a picture. I mean, it really does, and it's ornate, it's, it looks nice. So I really appreciate that. Until I hear differently, that's what that is. I showed this piece of glass briefly in the uh, yesterday's vlog. Well, believe it or not, you're not, you probably <laughs> won't even believe this. I had two archeologists here yesterday. One of them is a specialist on Native Americans, and the other one is a specialist on early uh, pioneer type uh, archaeology. The gal that was the uh, pioneer archaeology, she saw this and said, wow, that's about the oldest thing you've got here. And I said, really? 
She goes, yeah, that's really old. She goes, yeah, this is, this is mid-1800s or early 1800s. And I, it just took me back because it doesn't look, you know, it's partially machine made. According to her, these were blow molded uh, type glass uh, and they were doing this, you know, in the mid early 1800s to mid 1800s and blow molding this. That's why this glass is so thick. And, you know, it, I don't know that I can actually see air bubbles in it, but I kind of think there might be uh, like slight inclusions and things in this. It's not perfect. So I think it makes sense what she says. And since she's supposed to be an expert, by the way, these two experts came from Fort Leonard Wood. They're the on post uh, experts there for the base. Whenever they're doing digging and things around there, these two are on site and check out what's going on there in case they run into Native American artifacts or they run into uh, early pioneer type artifacts. So they do have expertise. And uh, so I'm gonna take her at her face value that this is very old piece of glass. And she said, according to all the stuff she saw that I have dug up, she feels like this is at least as old as anything, if not older. Those same two archaeologists, though, looked at this. They feel like this might be natural rather than man-made. You know, I dug this a long time ago. I showed it on the channel briefly. Some of you might remember that I found this underneath that piece of concrete up at the old house up here uh, next to our rental property. So this is not from the back back there. So don't confuse this. This is found up here in the front of the property and it was underneath the porch when I was digging that signal under the porch where I found the boot heel. But anyway, Everyone guessed that this was some sort of like an insulator or something like that. I showed it to those two and neither one of them thought that's the case. Both of them thought this is some sort of natural rock. I mean, I sort of agree with that because it's very heavy, like a rock, but this on here is like a glass, like a volcanic glass, and I don't know where that could have come from around here. So it's still, to me, I'm, I'm a little bit hesitant in buying their, their thought on this. Their, their argument for it was the way that this naturally blends. And if you look at it really close, it does naturally blend. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's got like layers of just blending as it's going through there. And man-made probably wouldn't do that. So I don't know. I'm, this one here, I'm a little skeptical on, but they looked at it and that's what they both said. So. I got to go with that for now. I didn't show this yesterday, but I found this back there too. I think this is a girth for a, uh, you know, uh, a horse. Um, it's very old. It's really old. You know, you'd put your strap through here and the hole would catch on this, obviously. And this is probably the adjustment end here for the length. And then this is where you tighten it here when you go up to your saddle. You know, I mean, I've used a lot of girths. I've never seen one quite like this one. But in the modern day, they have a, you know, this bottom piece here would be a movable piece, you know, and you'd put, put it through the hole on the leather. So I'm sure that's the same difference here that's what's going on here. And I, I didn't, uh, you know, they didn't give me much response on this uh, in terms of whether they thought this could be Civil War or not. They're not, actually, they're not Civil War buffs. But uh, anyway, um, I'm pretty positive that's what this is, is a leather girth type deal. It even has something I have never seen before. It's got these little knobs here uh, to keep the leather from sliding. You know, it, like when you, when you tie your uh, knot in your uh, girth for your, your leather there. You, uh, I don't know what that knot's called anymore. But anyway, uh, this would keep the leather from sliding back, which is, you know, sometimes common with uh, girths. You know, your saddle will loosen up. And then lastly, I won't name any names, but one of my frequent flyer customers that you've seen a lot of his instruments on the show here tried to burst my bubble about this Indian head penny. He said, first of all, you're not even close. He says, this is definitely not the rarest mintage of these pennies. Now, I didn't go back and look up his information, but all I do know is I looked on three or four different websites for coins and things, and all three or four said this was the lowest mintage. So I went with that. It may not be true. He said that the 1877 is far fewer minted. He's probably right. 
He usually is. And he said the little bit of uh, mineralization on the back will just destroy the value. Well, he didn't burst my bubble because like I said, I don't plan to sell it. It's part of the farm history. So to me, it's just as important as it ever was. Just for the record, here's another one. This is a 1900 that I found up at the old farmhouse here on the front of the property. And this one was in far worse, I mean like significantly far worse condition than this one here that I just pulled out, this 1885. I didn't think this one was restorable. Look how nice it looks now. All I did was give it a light wipe with vinegar. I just put it up, vinegar on a towel and just wiped it. It didn't destroy the green patina and it got rid of all the mineral mineralization that was all over this thing. So I think I'll just wipe this one lightly. Now, I already can hear the comments. You're not supposed to clean coins. It destroys the value. Um, you missed the first comment. It's already destroyed because it's got mineral mineralization on it. Bingo, I'm going to clean it. <laughs> just that simple. And I don't care if it destroys the value. I appreciate your uh, nice comments and helping me solve these mysteries. All of you, I really do appreciate it. It's been fun uh, checking these things out. Oh, before I let you go, I got one more thing. You know, <clears throat> I have this Mind Labs Equinox 800 metal detector. Seems like a really fine detector. One of the top detectors on the market today, I'm sure of that may not be the best, but I, who could say which one is the best? It's a very good detector. I've been very happy with it. Swinging it out there, I'm just having a great time. But during the winter, when I'm wearing coats and jackets and everything, this little piece was on here, and this extra little piece is so when you lay it down, it has something to rest on. You know, this is just like feet to hold it up off the ground or to keep it, you know, keep it steady when you lay it on the ground. Well, half the time I lay it on the ground sideways anyway. I don't pay much attention to this because it's grass and soft stuff out there. And I think laying it this way is probably more stable. You know what I'm saying? So this kept getting caught on my coat and coat tail and in my pocket and everything as I'm swinging. It was driving me crazy. Just literally driving me nuts. So I took it off. Well, the problem with taking it off is this thing comes off then too because the, the screw goes through the hole here in the center there that you can see and goes all the way through the handle and all the way through that. So what did I do? I made myself a replacement out of wood. I just made a real thin piece of wood there. See, like you can't just put the screw in there. The screw's too long and it either doesn't tighten up or it'll go all the way through your rubber pad. So you can't just put the screw back in. So I made a space holder there out of wood and uh, worked perfectly. So I just took a drill, drilled down through the end of a piece of wood first. It's sycamore in this case. Then I uh, took the bandsaw and sliced, off, sliced around that hole, as you can see there, and then I sliced right through the hole, or actually I sliced through the hole first and then sliced around it, whichever way, it doesn't matter. And uh, then I just took it over to the sander and cleaned it up, put a little bit of a Be Good oil on it, and there you go, Bob's your uncle, as they say on the internet these days. <laughs> but that works great, and now it doesn't catch on my code or any of that stuff. So if you're having that problem with your detector, you can make yourself one of these fairly easily. I think it was a 7 8 drill bit that I used to drill down through the, uh, the board. Then I just drilled a hole in the dead center of it and put this thing through. Absolutely love that little modification. This thing here is more trouble than it's worth in my opinion. Well, that's about it for today. I hope you enjoyed today's update and finding out some of these mysteries and hopefully think we have them solved. They're solved until somebody comes up with a better explanation. Hopefully we'll see you this evening at uh, Dickie's Barbecue. Make sure you do uh, a thumbs up on this video. And if you're not yet subscribed, why well, shame on you. Get that done, please. And we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you.